Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we'll have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. You're listening to Top Traders Unplugged, where I continue my conversation with Marty Lewick, co-founder and director of research of Aspect Capital. Disintermediation of the interbank market. Do you remember right. that? Yes. So you know, as it you know, as it became more democratized and everyone had access to mm -hmm. the same price feeds. Sure. Well, you know, the 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 the, uh, the bank trading desks had to you know, had to make a, a living yeah. and um, and spent time understanding our models. So back to the um, sure. uh, back to, the, you know, the early point about being being picked off. But yeah. um, so uh, what that told us was that our, we just had too much of a market impact. We were too visible to the markets. So around that period, there, there was a uh, same same effects we were capturing, Niels, but in a different way that meant that our entry and exit to the markets was much, much smoother sure. and effectively invisible. So since then, you know, huge development and huge focus on execution to make it, uh, uh, to really obfuscate what we're doing, to dribble our trades into the markets in, in random uh, pieces at, at random delays sure. um, and really, you know, try and exploit the market volatility rather than forcing our business to get done um, as quickly <laughs> as possible. Sure, interesting. Um, and so, so sorry, you, you no. then. So, so that that was a sort of starting place to sure. describe what uh, what aspect, what the diversified program looks like today. Mm. Um, in in talking about the grand sweep of how the the program has evolved, you know, it has remained predominantly uh, medium term trend following. Mm -hmm. That is what we are committed to delivering to our clients. So, mm -hmm. you know, you go through a, a challenging period for trend following. The temptation is to introduce or, or, or other models or to change the weights, um, either to reflect what would have worked mm -hmm. or to reflect what you think will work. That we, do, we don't think that's our place. Sure. Uh, it is for some other firms because they've, they've sold themselves as, you know, multi-strat or, or whatever it is. But our place is to deliver quality, uh, medium-term trend-following uh, returns to our institutional and 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 now broader uh, client base. Sure. Um, the eighty percent of the portfolio is focused on those trend-following models. We trade uh, over one hundred and fifty markets and multiple contracts in many of them. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's probably around two hundred instrument, one hundred and eighty or two hundred instruments. Um, and 20% of the risk, Niels, is in a range of, uh, we, we talk about modulating factors or, right. or, or complementary models that are designed to, um, if you will, take some of the rough edges off of, off of trend following mm -hmm. or, or take advantage of orthogonal or diversifying effects that we believe have a similar level of persistence or traction as the momentum component right so not really mean reversion or counter trend or is it more on the exit side or that that it helps you um get out a bit quicker or get in a bit earlier that these models help you um actually i'd sort of think about it slightly differently mm -hmm. there sure. so it, it, although i may have misled you by using a term like modulating <laughs> that what that what that doesn't mean is that they are all you know focused on what the tr 
trend models are doing and right. therefore speeding them up or slowing them down or, or making them more more sensitive or now they're they're effectively capturing other factors right now, it may be that some of those factors are related to the trend fault so they may it may for example be relative momentum between instruments in your in your trend following um, a portion which clearly is a diversifying effect mm -hmm. but um, they will have the effect of 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 capturing diversifying factors in uh, you know, where either you've got you've got different information sources whether it's uh, whether it's a carry effect right in in, in FX or in fixed income or or, or in equities um, you know you can look at, at features and different dynamics of, of the uh, uh, of, of the term structure mm -hmm. um, you can look at as I say relative momentum pieces you can look at um, mean reverting or other market dynamics typically faster strategies mm -hmm. um, but I we don't choose to look at them as you know as sort of is this getting us out of our trend right. following position mm -hmm. fact I, I should also stress that uh, e that the we continue to evolve and improve and and um, hammer away at the uh, at the trend following piece and sure. and and I'm often asked that in due diligence questionnaires. You know, you've <laughs> been doing this for thirty years. I would have thought you'd have figured it out by now. <laughs> um, and uh, and there's always more. There's always more that you can do, and it's and it's fascinating. Yes, absolutely. How um, how do you weight the portfolio in broad terms between financial markets and commodity markets? Because that's always sort of being brought up when you uh, when you compare smaller managers to larger managers. Yeah. Um, well, not surprisingly, you, you know, uh, our our starting point is a very agnostic outlook. So we we absolutely. Uh, Defy or eschew the the worldview that says you know you can you can look at what's happened historically and predict what's what's going to uh, happen in the near future. Obviously, with the that that is essentially what you know the behavioral aspect of of trend following is based on. But your ability to infer that well because I've had a good run in bonds means that they're going to continue to perform. Uh, so I'm going to go overweight in bonds. That's that's not something we ascribe to. So it's very you know, we are seeking the most agnostic portfolio construction we can, and therefore, if I had no, you know, liquidity or correlation constraints, I would trade, um, you know, an an even spread of of sectors, Niels. Mm. Um, so my starting place is is uh, broad diversification across. We we talk about seven sectors um, in, internally. And then I will modulate, or I've used that word too often, <laughs> but I, w I will, um, you know, flex that um, that agnostic diversification with appropriate consideration for the long-term structural correlation between markets, um, and also cognizant of the liquidity characteristics of the market. So. Um, and and that's something that we review on a regular basis, and 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 the portfolio allocation structure slightly, you know, flexes very gently around dif different liquidity characteristics. So we have both, you know, obviously there are hard limits that the exchange will um, impose sure. on on you in many markets that you can't be bigger than position X, but we also uh, impose our own um, much more conservative constraints about how much. Uh, of the average daily volume or the open interest we're prepared to be and mm -hmm. how much we're prepared to be in, you know, in, in tail events. Um, and the, all of that feeds into a, a process that um, regularly and systematically determines what, um, what the allocation will look like. Mm. Do you have a lot of scope for growth when you look at the markets you trade, the balance of the portfolio as it is today, uh, and the you know, uh, constraints that you just mentioned. I mean, does it still allow you to to grow uh, substantially from from here without having to change that side of things, so to speak? Absolutely. Um, you know, there is there is considerable capacity in the program, um, and uh, I. You know, and, and we're very careful about it. Mm. I don't, I don't say that willy nilly, sure. because as those flexes happen in the, in the program, we we look to understand what different 
features, you know, how that's changing the the um, correlation structure and 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 the um, you know any potential impact it has on the markets, um, and that you know w- that gives us a great deal of comfort that there is a large. Uh, you know, there's there's significant capacity, but it also, Niels, gives us, you know, a clear point at which we know we need to be careful. So it's right. not like, yeah, just keep going until something goes wrong. Sure. It's, it's well, given these conservative constraints, when we hit this particular point, then we need to be very careful. But so, so uh, you know, number what comes out of that is, number one, you need to be cognizant of not just your own size, but also what's going on in the market. So, mm. you, you know, you could stand still and the markets could dry up. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so you need you need to be aware of that, no, number one. Let me um, ask you a slightly different question. Um, and that's a little bit about, as you say, you know, you need to be aware of what uh, the what markets can handle. I assume that you trade uh, foreign exchange and not, yep. this, and not just foreign exchange via futures. Yeah, we, we trade them both, but yeah. pre- predominantly uh, interbank. Yeah. Sure. And um, given what's, what happened in 2008, and nine, where certainly liquidity in those markets seemed to um, uh, change dramatically, uh, let's put it that way, um, and and what's going on in, in, in the financial industry as a whole today, um, the concerns that we have perhaps with some of the things happening in the banking sector and what the central banks are doing and, and, and the fact that it's really opaque in terms of what is inside a bank. Um, mm-hmm. are, you, are you concerned about um, liquidity drying up again? Should we enter into a new phase of, of, of the crisis? And, and have you... Have you learned something to deal with that sudden change in liquidity in in a market? Okay, so th- I mean, there there are two parts to that. One is the sort of ambient liquidity mm. um, uh, of the markets and our ability to respond to you know changes in those. If we see mm. the spread uh, expanding, or you know, or, or we see a, a period of unfavorable um, behavior. In our in our execution algos, mm. um, how we respond to that? I'll come back to that in a second. Sure. The the other, I don't know whether you were alluding to this, was you know in in the crisis of of two thousand and eight, there were you know literally there were bank lines being frozen. Yes, you know. So um, what I mean again, I, I this at, at least were cognizant before two thousand and eight that you know. A, a prudent uh, managed account holder will have sort of backup relationships. Yeah. So, uh, and, and certainly we had backup prime brokerage relationships. So everything we do, you know, and again, that's sort of, a, I think, a truism now for for most of the institutional money management firms is you've got multiple clearing houses, you've got multiple prime brokers, and if you can persuade your clients to go through the pain of setting up the multiple relationships, mm. and you can go through the additional burden of keeping them alive mm. it just means you have that degree of flexibility that if heaven forbid um, but it did happen you know heaven forbid your lines dry up with uh, prime broker a mm. that you, you you can move those uh, positions and carry on trading at prime broker b so absolutely you, you know i think we were we were well placed to survive that cleanly in 2008 but you know, but we've continued to strengthen that feature of the business, that operational robustness, um, and and I think that uh, you know the regulators and the and the due diligence um, folks that have come in have have seen you know that that w- w- was probably a model of of, of how to do it. Mm. Um, in in terms of the market dynamics, um, well, you know, you've sort of highlighted. W- one of the most challenging markets to get true numbers on on what liquidity dynamics are Mm. but there we have um so i I make two observations the first is the point i wanted to make earlier in addition to um to being clear about what our capacity is with a given set of markets we continue to monitor and include new markets so uh, by and you know over the past few years we've introduced a range of non-deliverable forward currencies which expands the universe of opportunity okay it also expands the um you know the the uh the the um complexity of monitoring their liquidity um, their liquidity profiles um but i think that the most important feature in what we do so 
most of our of our strategy trading, you know, sort of ninety six percent of it is is uh, box to box. It's mm-hmm. electronic execution, sure. but it's monitored twenty four hours a day by the um, by the very experienced trading team, and they have you know there are certain circuit breakers or thresholds or or canaries in coal mines, if you will, that um, indicate where we see sporadic. Um, you know, l- changes in liquidity profiles, shall we say. Mm. Um, and if we see those, the portfolio construction will um, will adapt. Mm. Sure, sure. I wanted to ask a slightly <clears throat> different question, which is something that um, I'm not int- entirely sure how to how to best phrase it, but but let me try and explain. Um, so on one part, I think many people think of trend following as okay, but you you, you get your signal to buy or to sell, and then you follow uh, along for for the ride, and 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 you have some kind of uh, position size algorithm. But when I listen to what you're explaining, um. I think what you're actually saying more is that since you have smoothed out this process and are not looking at it as a black and white concept, um, it, it probably the position size is more maybe a ref- reflection of the strength of the signal because the more um, confirmation you get, the bigger you will build your position and so on and so forth. Um, but in my mind, I think a lot of the secret to success of trend following is not so much actually where where we buy and where we sell are we a day late or a day early a lot of it is really the the, the risk management and thereby the position sizing itself that that's a big part of the secret source to the success or uh, the robustness of trend following H- how do you view that I, I i think you're you're absolutely right there there's you know it's what we do is a holistic challenge. You can mm. you can you can get overly focused on the you know an an individual uh, trend following model at an individual time scale, but it's the combination of all of the pieces put together, mm. and the combination of all of the markets put together, and how you risk manage the whole that determines obviously your your end performance. Mm. I'd, I'd make two observations. The first is that the positions that we hold. Are yes a function of signal strength and conviction, sure. but th- that, as you would expect, would be modulated by w- what you perceive as the risk of, mm. of the market. So, for a given signal strength, if I see the volatility of a market, uh, which is a cipher mm. for risk, if you sure. will, uh, if you see that say double, I will effectively have my position to maintain the same risk for yes. that given signal strength, point sure. one. Point two is that you know it's not an inexorable line. The stronger the, the, the trend, the bigger position I'll put on because as you can imagine, Niels, that way lies madness. So sure. there's a, you know, knowing effectively when to back off and perhaps when to be a provider of liquidity to the markets rather sure. than a, uh, an, a, you know, a consumer of liquidity, that's another delicate um, feature of mm. of of what we do yeah so in effect um, just to make clear to the listeners you're not actually using a stop loss per se because it comes automatically as the strength of the signal changes your position changes along with it that that's exactly right so it's a it's a gradually uh, modulating signal um, and the, the other thing that I I really like about what it is we do and obviously we spent time researching super fast you know intraday models and da 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 and yeah. and and there's there's utility in those and some people do them very well but sure. one of the things i like to stress for an institutional investor um is the intuitive qualities of medium term trend following and the way uh, what i mean by that niels is that you know if you read the financial times or mm. the wall street journal or or you know your local financial newspaper and you follow roughly what's going on in global markets mm. then you will have a good intuitive sense of the positions that we hold mm. so that obviously you know the 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 detail and the complexity of exactly the position size that we hold, which, as you've said, is a function of signal strength, volatility, um, you know where you are in the development of of, of that trend, sure. portfolio construction, 
risk management? Are you up against any exposure constraints? All of those pieces, holistic challenge, very complex. Mm. But by and large, if you stand back a, just a short way and look at the ebb and flow and yeah. the, the dynamics of how that portfolio is moving from day to day, it's very intuitive, and sure. you will you you can broadly, as an institutional investor, understand why a trend-following portfolio makes and loses money when it does. Which has always actually puzzled me, because people often criticize, um, you know, what we do from saying that it's complex, it's difficult to understand, and I'm just puzzled about this because it's really not that difficult to to understand that when something goes up you buy because you think it's going higher and if it goes down you sell because you think it's going lower compared to you know uh, a fixed income arbitrage or, or whatever they call uh, yep, these yep. strategies um, yet people seem to love those strategies more maybe we have time to talk about that more from a philosophical point of view later on um, <laughs> I wanted to ask you just a final point maybe uh, about the program itself um, and that is and, and and going back to research a little bit here how much research do you actually need to do to overcome or to improve efficient execution so to speak is is that a big part of research when you get to your size to to make sure you you can continue to grow and 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 have efficient execution yes um, well so as as a research team we uh you know we look at the problem of of continuing to evolve and develop the program we 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 break it down into the you know the core diversify uh, the sorry the core trend following sure. components the um diversifying uh modulating strategies the portfolio construction and risk management piece and then execution mm. and and by and large there is always someone working on something in in each of those areas um, and you know over the sweep of time we will have periods of of more concentration in one area than in in others so mm. uh, so it's a bit of an ebb and flow so sure. about four years ago we embarked on the on the transition to a, a wholly uh, box to box so you know if, if you look at the sweep of of uh, evolution of, of execution back mm. in the good old days of of where we would trade binary mm -hmm. in big in big clips sure. and we and we had to get it down to an open outcry market well our our execution research in those days Niels was to go to Chicago <laughs> and meet the biggest <laughs> and baddest floor brokers yeah. and you'd you'd hire them because they <laughs> they got to the front of the pack sure. um, uh, and then you, you know so over time markets have become more electronic and we've that that's uh, that's played into you know the the technology led led firm uh, and then actually t taking the leap to a predominantly box-to-box -box world, right. or, albeit you know monitored carefully, sure. um, that has been an enormous commitment of research effort and, and, and investment. Sure. Um, it requires an ongoing monitoring. I, I, I would stress that you know what. We don't do HFT, so it's not we're not going head to head with sort of an HFT sure, firm sure. where the al where you're swapping out algos every few minutes or every few hours. Sure. Um, we have a, a suite of uh, execution algorithms which are generally fit for purpose. We uh, ensure that they are correctly parameterized for the liquidity, you know, for the character. You know, you mar markets change their characteristics what's sure. the sort of resting uh, bid offer spread what are the, the the typical clip sizes that people are are, are making available those are um, characteristics of, of markets that we need to review and reparameterize on on a regular basis and obviously monitor if they're changing more rapidly than we'd expect mm -hmm. so it's an ongoing monitoring effort uh, um, I think because we're not slamming the markets with um, with uh, you know very fast models um, you know our, our execution now goes are, are, are predominantly looking to make us I'd love to say invisible but certainly to <laughs> ob ob obfuscate what we sure. do and and to capture if you will a patient's premium we're not in a hurry to get our business done sure. but but uh, it's an ongoing effort yeah absolutely risk management and, and not that I want to because I think we we've talked a lot about that already but I, I, I had a, a sort of a general question and that is 
How do you define risk? Meaning there are so many different risk measures. People talk about value at risk, margin to equity, position size, you know, uh, risk to stop, whatever it might be. But there is, is there, is there something that you've come across which you feel very comfortable with looking at when you look at risk, what, what that means to, to you and to your portfolio? Well, I, I, I'll, I'll go slightly at, at a tangent. So, sure. so you know, I, I think that I, I've banged on earlier about how uh, important we think the risk management challenge is yeah. in, in terms of how you put the component pieces together and then ensuring that you don't get uh, transfixed by VAR measures, making right. sure that you have other measures of risk. I think that's been an important uh, piece of the of the puzzle for us, mm. and and stood us in good stead um, in this period of extremely low volatility, where you run the sure. risk that uh, you know if you're just looking at VAR, you can blow up and up and up and up a position, and then if if volatility returns to the market, you can get a very unpleasant surprise. Yeah. Um, so you know, yes. Yes, we look at those suite of issues, and yes, we're obviously uh, very focused on operational risk, having had um, you know the institutional piece very much as the you know, fundamental DNA of sure. aspect. Sure. The other the other thing that I think is interesting about you know how we've approached risk is, is if I if I talk about model risk, right, for a moment. That's interesting. Yes, um, and because I th- I think this is. This is great, and again, it's part of the journey that mm. you know. It's, this was never written in a textbook anywhere. Um, mm. As I say, I couldn't spell risk in the in the, <laughs> in the early days of of, of AHL, um, and um, and for a while, you know, we'd say, you know, the the. Um, uh, the consultants would come in and they say, "So, who's the uh, director of research?" And right. you know, my, Michael Adam or I would stick up our hands, and then they'd say, "And who's the director of, of risk?" And we'd also stick up our hands, and <laughs> and they'd sort of say, "Well, that doesn't work." So, um, the the point here is that you know we've talked earlier about uh, encouraging a, a collegiate and a collaborative and an innovative research effort, and that's what we've done, and I think I think we do it we do it quite well, mm. but but it's having the right checks and balances and we try to create an atmosphere that's sort of like um, an academic peer review group so right. we have a, a just a super risk team uh, you know every one of them is is just as smart and and just as experienced as any of the researchers and it's and it's their job to shred <laughs> sure. if they can um, the the best research that comes out of uh, out sure. of the research team. Sure. So is, there's a very formal uh, risk review process, both of every component that comes out, every new yeah component idea that comes out of the research team, whether it's an evolution or an improvement to the trend following piece, or a new modulating strategy, or an amendment to the execution algos, or the portfolio construction methodology. Each one of those will get looked at in isolation and taken apart by either with uh, you know some out of sample data, some synthetic data, uh, some hi- examination of the hypothesis or the failure cases that you know they absolutely um, stress the components. And then Niels, uh, you know we we typically aim for three releases a year. They look at the holistic release. Right. So you may have a you know I may have a a, a couple of tweaks, uh, mm-hmm. evolutionary improvements to the trend following. I may have something new going on in the modulating piece. I may have another, but they get, they get aggregated into a new program release mm. and the risk team will have reviewed every component, but then they also review the dynamics of the overall, you know, how all of the pieces work together. Sure. And I think that that is a crucially important um, piece of the problem, which again may get under, uh, under recognized. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Do you think correlations today is a meaningful thing to look at so to speak um or are we just uh, living in a world where markets get more and more correlated uh, certainly within sectors but maybe even across sectors I, I i absolutely think it's a crucial um thing that we look at both for for opportunity set um mm. in what we do and also for the, the risk management challenge um i think that it ebbs and flows and we've sure. been through a period of, of as you say you know what what has felt like um, a secular increase in um, in correlation to that to the sort of um, 
you know, you, you question, uh, why am I doing this? Sure. In sort of 2012, where the risk on, risk off, <laughs> everything just, you know, you, 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 you began to think it was somebody was, had singled you out for, Absolutely. Uh, uh, to be taken apart. But um, uh, so I, I, I think it's, uh, it's an important part uh, of what we do. I, I think right now we're seeing uh, correlations begin, you know, just the, the signs that the, the opportunity set is broadening. Um, I, I, so I don't give up on the, um, on the prospect <laughs> of having uh, diversification. I, I think absolutely the world is now a, a much more diverse set of opportunities than it was, you know, uh, 18 months or two years ago, Neil. Sure. Sure. Now we've talked about the risk management side, and of course, part of uh, what we have to uh, accept in 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 running these strategies is is drawdowns. And uh, I wanted to spend just a few uh, minutes uh, on that. One of the things that investors seem to struggle with, uh, if I can put it like that, is the emotions that yeah. drawdowns um, you know uh, bring with them. You've been around, as you, you you mentioned, you've seen it before. How do we best help investors understand that um, a drawdown in a strategy like yours is not necessarily the same as some kind of open-ended risk where it's just going to continue to go down and down and down again? Um, because, of course, we, we are dealing with issues that Uh, are related to how the human mind is is working and 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 we have these biases inside us mm. uh, but how do we best um, give them comfort in times of drawdown and and help them take some of the emotional stress uh, out and and i guess as i asked this marty because we see so often that investors and we've just seen it recently i believe Uh, again, sort of, uh, and I think sort of most people uh, will will know what I'm talking about. But a lot of money have left uh, the CTA strategy exactly. at the at the worst possible time. So, so possible. yeah, uh, um, and and I always, um, you know, I love to refer to. I, I don't know whether you're familiar with Peter Lynch, who was just sort of a legendary sure. um, fund manager at, at at Fidelity. And I once saw a piece of analysis that. Um, looked at how much money individual investors had actually made with Peter right. and, and and it was it was a tragedy because mm. you know as his performance would uh, you know leap forward that's when the money sloshed in and then it would have a drawdown sure. and that's when the money sloshed out so if yeah. you aggregated those chunks of money that typically bought at the highs and sold at the lows mm. um, it was nowhere like the performance that the the, the chap had generated sure. so I, I don't <laughs> you know when you've got a an, an upset client you probably don't start the conversation with that <laughs> with, with that uh, uh, Story. observation but yeah. it's a, it's one observation the, the you know the next observation I make is that You know, again, provided the client has bought into managed futures for the right reason, you know, and and you 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 know what I'm saying here, sure. here is that is that if it's just been if it's just popped out the top of you know the only thing that made you money in <laughs> 2008, and you just say, well, I'll have some of that, yeah, without understanding. Ending its role as a diversifying constituent, you know, that will move risk to capture the prevalent opportunities, be they rising or falling markets uh, on a well diversified basis. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, um, you know, if they have understood that it is in their portfolio to provide diversification from the equities piece and the bond piece and and what other whatever other assets they have in the portfolio then what goes with that that is that you know but if by definition that you've put this thing in your portfolio because it's uncorrelated then you know when you have periods that um, equities are plummeting and your managed futures is making money well then we're we're okay aren't we Neil? <laughs> we're, we're heroes But if you turn that around and the equity markets are booming and managed futures is losing money, well, you're an idiot. But that goes with the turf of, of I mean, obviously, I'm not trying to present it as anti-correlated sure. with, um, with, um, with equities because we know it isn't. Um, but, uh, but that low level of correlation does mean that it will behave differently from the stuff that 
is on certainly on the front page of of, of the uh, FT or or the Wall Street Journal, um, and there it's so it, it there is a level of idiosyncratic risk. So mm-hmm. first of all, you have to make sure that your clients are comfortable with that idiosyncratic risk, and they look at it in the context of their portfolio rather than just transfixing on the line item. Mm-hmm. Second thing is everything goes through a drawdown, mm-hmm. whether it's whether it's managed futures or the equity markets and boy sure. when, when they hit a drawdown they they really do it well don't Absolutely, they they, yeah. they they make our drawdowns look um look small yeah um and any other strategy so to to lose confidence in in momentum investing or trend following is you know um, you know, what, smarter folks than I have written tomes and got PhDs and even Nobel prizes mm. on talking about, you, you, you know, that that you know, no one factor nails is, is going to work all the time. Sure. But a well constructed portfolio that exposes you to, you know, equity risk premium um, to carry from mm. time to time to to value investing to to um, yes, I, I mean, gosh. Um, you know those value investors around the time of the of the tech bubble. Mm. You know they were they were getting it in the in the neck. But if you saw a um, uh, you know if you saw a a, a value investor uh, suddenly change their spots and and um, be, become persuaded that it was you know I'm I've given up on my value investing approach and I'm going to become a momentum trader. <laughs> you'd probably run for the hills. So. Sure. Uh, so th- all of those are good reasons to support, you know, sticking with the strategy that you have invested in and the utility that it provides to your portfolio. And again, in my view, that's also a, a little bit of a reminder to the manager community that investors have bought us because we provide a utility to them. Mm. You don't want to go surprising them um, and, and, and suddenly looking like a, a, a carry sure, trade. Sure. No, I, I completely agree, Marty. I mean, I think... Again, as you rightly say, it's not just about uh, investors necessarily not understanding um, the concepts in full. It's also about how we as managers have tried to explain it uh, over the years. And maybe we haven't done a good job in doing that. And I personally find that um, maybe we've spent too much time focusing on explaining um, how we do things and, and what we do rather than actually focusing on why we do it. And I think that, again, if you can get people to buy into uh, why you do what you do and, 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 and you know, your beliefs, so to speak, yep. um, it becomes a different and a much more um a much much more easier uh, or an easier conversation so to speak so i think that's true um i wanted to ask you just one more question on um on sort of the 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 drawdown side and and, yep. and maybe it's a very short answer for you but i don't know but we we try to eliminate risk as much as we can we try to manage risk as much as we can but is there anything that's left in the back of your mind when you go to sleep at night and where you say Mm, I don't really want to wake up tomorrow and this has happened. Meaning, is there anything where you simply just accept that this kind of risk I can't eliminate? So is there anything that kind of keep could keep you up at, uh, at night, so to speak? That's one of those questions where the more you think about it, the, le- the less sleep you'll get. So, <laughs> so I, a risk, risk management, I think, is about finding the right balance. So, right. Because so, on the one hand, we are paid to take risk, yep. um, but on the other hand, you don't want to take foolish risks that, that could be avoided. So starting at the really extreme end, you know, we, the, the world we live in is a, is a febrile place at the moment. Mm. And, um, you know, we've all lived through various you know, whether they're terrorist attacks or sure. hurricanes or, or, or tsunamis, which can knock out your ability to trade. And, mm. and that, that seems so, um, you know, when you put it like that, it's, well, it's, it's only money um, mm. as compared with the loss of life and, and, and sure. the significance of these effects. But sure. um, we do need to think about it. It's some, something to be aware of. What, what would you do in, mm. in the event that a certain exchange um, is 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 incapacitated i guess in a, you know in a, in an electronic world that is somewhat less of an issue than on the open outcry floors but mm. but still you know one's inability to, to trade a market just has to be the um uh one one of the the 
most uncontrollable events that you can um, can deal with. And then you sort of work your way in from there. Uh, we've talked about having multiple prime brokerage and, and uh, clearing mm. lines. It's making sure that you, you know, we obviously have a fiduciary responsibility to our clients to make sure that their money is is as safe as we can possibly ensure that it is mm. um, and, that, and that it doesn't get stuck if there's some kind of financial or, or again, geopolitical um, event. Uh, and, and then I, I think then really the risk management challenge is just to never being complacent. Mm. You know, I, you know, you've talked about the psychological challenge. There's clearly there are psychological challenges for the investors that it's our job to, uh, as you say, to to help them understand and to, to work our way through in a spirit of partnership. Um um, but there are also psychological challenges as as a manager, and boy, um, you should just expect always to see something new. Yeah, not true. I wanted to ask you. Uh, also, it's a little bit, I guess, a little bit about risk, but it's it's a completely different question. I want to tap into your um, to your mindset, if I could put it like that way, because um, you know you start off. Um, Many many years ago, um, with twenty five thousand, and then later on a hundred thousand, and and so as an entrepreneur, um, your mindset is of course okay. Let's do it. We, we're going to take certain levels of risk, and as you said, you over optimized. You did all sorts of things, but you didn't have any fear that okay, if it if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Um, the consequences, if I can put it that way, were not uh, so grand uh, at that time, and then suddenly years later you're super successful i mean you've got billions of dollars under management you've got 120 people uh, to feed every month how does that impact the mindset and the risk uh, willingness so to speak uh, of, of 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 you mm-hmm. um, does does that automatically lead to becoming more risk averse in a sense it it probably does, it, 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 Niels. I, I think it's it's part of part of the journey, yeah. of, uh, and and uh, you know also part of I guess growing up because <laughs> you know the the um, you know early AHL Brockham AHL was as you as you just there was no roadmap for yeah. for what we were doing and we just you know one day at a time and um if it had all blown up well <laughs> it wasn't a good idea in the first place sure. and we all would have gone off and done something else yeah so then you find yourself in the in the position where you are managing billions of dollars of other people you know it, it's it is important it is yeah pension fund money it's people's savings it's you know it's people's hopes and dreams and and as you say 120 people who 120 fantastic people and sure. and um you know uh, so my view actually maybe i have a i put it down actually to teamwork right so this is you know because i've sort of alluded to the fact that my my business career is not predicated on my genius because there isn't much of that it's on you know on being fortunate enough to work with some really talented people sure. and so uh, yeah, in many ways i think what i've tried to do is almost to keep a a, a childlike uh, in, uh, enthusiasm <laughs> an energy and outlook so it's somewhere between childlike and scientific there's sure. always new information there are always new opportunities there are always reasons to be cheerful and 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 that's that's my mindset but i think the maturation process that's happened to us as a business is that i trust uh, and surround myself with people that really can you know that nail this down way better than I can sure. you know so I, I think what I'm saying is that I haven't taken it upon myself to be all, all things to all men sure. um, to all in investors i i think that it's it's a combination of sort of you need the yin and the yang you need the people that are still entrepreneurial and coming up with wacky ideas and yeah. then you need that thorough diligent um process driven risk management review constant review constant you know could we do this better and 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 that's in our dna but but i like to think that we still have some of the um you know the youthful enthusiasm that hasn't gone away sure absolutely i mean speaking of youth uh, marty um succession plan 
<laughs> is that something that's ever been brought up when you sit down and you talk to your partners and say, what are we, are we doing this in 20 years or are we actually starting to think about like, you know, Don Capital, like Sunrise Capital, people who've been around for also 30, 40 years yeah. and who have put in place succession planning. Is that something you already think about? Well, we do, but it doesn't, you know, there isn't a secret file marked succession plan <laughs> that, that, you know, is, is like the D-Day landing. Sure. Um, because we've, you know, I, I talked earlier about that, that transition that you go through where, you know, you may think you know too much and then you have to trust the people around you. Mm. Um, I think we've, we've done that. So I am surrounded by you know a senior management team and in you know indeed de great depth in the business of people that are really talented really experienced um, and so succession planning is really not an issue sure. you know and, and and a lot of people own a, a own a stake in, in the business I think that Anthony and I in particular do this because we enjoy doing it yeah And, you know, and and that was so AHL was a happy accident. We sort sure. of bum, bumbled into it and all, you know, it all worked out very well. Aspect was very much a, an explicit sitting down and saying, you know, this is the vision that we're trying to create. Let, let's go and do it. So, you know, however many years later, 25 years <laughs> later, the, you know, the democratization of the managed futures industry. Well, we're well on that path, Niels. I think that that's been that's been super. I, I, I very much much want to get us through the recovery of, of the strategy from from the challenging times that that it's gone through and reaffirm its place in the if you will investors model portfolios um and 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 sing its praises um but uh, you know there are plenty of people here that do do can do what i do way better than i do it and um Uh, so, you know, it will mean me traveling less eventually, but I don't think there's going to be a day where I just hang up my, um, sure. hang up my uh, passport and, um, <laughs> and, and don't do this anymore. No. Um, I've got a couple more questions before I go to the last section, which is uh, sort of the more general and fun stuff. But um, you talk about the vision, so to speak. Um, what's the biggest challenge that you see in that future evolution or, or right where we are right now what do you think is the biggest challenge that you face challenge and opportunity i think every every business and you know every individual you know growth and evolution is not a linear process sure. is it Neil? absolutely so you, you sort of you know you, you think you're on a ledge you think you're in an <laughs> equilibrium condition and then something comes along and and the world shifts mm. and i think it's it's being able to adapt to those shifts and seeing the opportunities rather than just the threats mm. um, and I think what's going on is that you know this extended period of challenging performance has rattled many investors uh, and it's also you know it, it's it speaks to the continuing evolution of the fund management industry in general and what do I mean by that well you look at uh, you look at Go back once upon a time. If you wanted to invest in U.S. equities, you probably had to find a U.S. you know deep value manager and <laughs> pay, pay them a you know a handsome you know fee to manage your money. And 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 the world evolves and you know figure out. Well, hang on, um, I can get most of what this person did for me um, if I just get a you know an S and P tracker, mm. which cost me a few basis points. So you do that with the with a lot of your portfolio and then you find some real skill that adds some extra components and you're willing to pay for it. Yeah. I think that's what we're seeing. We're seeing an evolution in our space and in other, um, and in other uh, uh, hedge funds or alternative strategies. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's fee pressure, there's pressure to deliver purer factors, if you will. Um, and, you know, we can all, say oh dear it's not what it used to be fee yields are not what they used to be it's just a, it's a terrible thing and you know hope this performance returns so we can all crank our fees back up <laughs> i i view it as you know it's it's a natural evolution and um uh you know 
a pl- opportunity. O- also, con- concomitant with that is that um, you know, once upon a time, if you wanted to, as as everyone should have wanted to get into managed futures and have them in their portfolio, goodness me, we made it hard as an industry. You know, the the, the products you, you needed to sign you sign over your firstborn and your. Um, <laughs> You know the risk disclosure sure. statements, and uh, and be prepared to f- pay just wild fees mm. for this stuff. Um, and it's it's becoming much more available. So when I talk about democratization, when I talk about a place in the model portfolios of pension funds and of you know mom and pops, that's 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 where I want it to be. Um, so yes, yeah, there are challenges. For fees, performance, drawdowns, all of the things that we dwell on, but it's also a fantastic set of opportunities. Absolutely. Do you, I mean, it's no secret that um, a small percentage of the um, hedge funds and managed futures industry manages a very, very large portion of the assets. I don't know the exact numbers, but if Mm -hmm. I say that 10% of the managers manage 90% of the assets, it's probably not that far away. Is there a risk in in that, that so many of the smaller firms uh, struggle and and essentially are being forced out? Yes, yes, absolutely. There's a risk. Um, And I, I, I'm very interested in those traders, <laughs> in those models. Sure. You, you, you know, I don't want that that talent base to go to waste. Sure. Uh, but it's Niels. It is a, you know, it, it is a Darwinian process. So, yeah. um, I think if if I put my crystal ball uh, or put, put, you know look into my crystal ball, I think what's going to happen is, you know, performance will return. Sure. I think we. Yeah, I, I don't know when, don't take that as a guarantee, but sure. as performance returns for what we do and people's appetite for it improves, then some of the smaller folks who have just not had a chance recently in a, in a very difficult environment uh, are going to have a chance. Mm. I think some of these seed uh, seeding funds and um, some of the fund to funds managers that make a point of of investing in the in the in the smaller folks um, are are going to have a run, and then you will. I won't say a change. Of the guard because I'm not going anywhere and I'm sure David isn't going anywhere um, but you will see some other other people develop um, substantial businesses and and I think that's fine again yeah, yeah. so so this isn't about me trying to bar you know raise the barriers to entry and sure. make sure no. that nobody else can get in here but no no absolutely not and I don't think that that actually the managers them, themselves seek that I think it's more the investors who tend to focus too much on on in my opinion, maybe the size rather than what's in behind. But let me let me finish up uh, this section with just a couple of uh, uh, different uh, questions completely. I I try to remember to ask my guests what they would like to ask the next guest that I speak to to get kind of a a, a trader's uh, insight to what would be really interesting to hear. But with you, I'd like to do something slightly different. Okay. And that is to say, what would you like to ask my next guest and what if that guest was David Harding? Oof. Well, David. <laughs> we we usually run through a random set of um, uh, of topics whenever we whenever we meet and speak, and, and sure. he's he's highly entertaining. I think, given um, you know what we see from the outside of mm. of, of Winton, I I would love to um, to get his perspective on. Um, you know, does he see the managed futures industry uh, um, continuing in, uh, you know, as a, a self-standing entity, or sure. is it is it going to be subsumed into, you know, some kind of mainstream mega asset management uh, business. business? So, is it, you know, is 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 Winton heading the, you know, is Winton, AQR, Bridgewater, you know? Are these the, uh, the 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 mega firms of the future? Sure. Uh, the, the Googles and the Facebooks of uh, of our industry, or or is there still space? Um, and and does he support? And would he still um, think of himself as as uh, a managed futures um, manager? I love that. Yeah. Um, final question on this section, and that is really, I mean, you um, you mentioned before that you uh, obviously are part of uh, many, many due diligence meetings, phone calls, uh, questionnaires, and so on and so forth. Um, but I wanted to ask, 
What do you think is the question that investors forget to ask or fail to ask when they do their due diligence today? What should they be asking you? Um, I don't have a sound bite of the one question that they're always missing, but I, I think it's a lot of the areas that we've covered. It's making sure that 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 they get that both they appreciate and that the manager they're speaking with appreciates that it's a holistic endeavor. Mm. So I, when I speak to fledgling managers or people that we're talking to, and, and, and as you allude to, it's a difficult environment out there. So we do speak to a lot of, of folks that, that have run some money. You know, if if the person is just banging on about their entry points and exit points and um you know the stochastic models and the da 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 da, da yeah, that's that's important but it's by no means the whole story so it's making sure that the um the manager can articulate how they many of the questions you've asked me Neil how do you how do you put the pieces together how do you th- think about uh, the risk management how do you and how do you think about evolving this what's wrong what what's what do you like least about your program at the moment and what are you doing about it because mm. um, you know I think it's the the ability to evolve the program that is um, is crucial and that's what separ- separates uh, you know the, the long story standing firms from from uh, the, the untested sure sure and um, moving to the last uh, section Marty um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about what you feel it takes to become a great trader great fund manager but in more in the context as to because I'm sure a lot of our listeners are are listening also with the hope and aspiration to one day be the next aspect uh, but uh, is there any advice that you can give to to new or smaller managers for that matter that they can learn from that you've lessons that you've learned over the years that have kind of helped you um, you know get through different times or mm-hmm. evolve well I, I I think you know my starting place is 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 just It, it's obviously a very broad church, mm. and and my particular style is different. Say from David's is different from a discretionary macro manager mm. or a discretionary um, CTA. Um, so I guess sort of first nugget is is be true to yourself because mm. if you are if you are just a passionate um, discretionary trader. Then hone those skills rather than, um, you know, constraining yourself unnecessarily and by 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 the belief that it has to be systematic. I don't mm-hmm. know. I'm not sure that was it. <laughs> no, no. Or, or or actually, conversely, the other way around. Um, because I look at someone like me, and I I am way more of a scientist, Niels, than I am a trader, so. and and therefore I've we have tried to capture in the model. You know how we how we would rationally respond to uh, to events to um, how the portfolio evolves, which isn't to mean that you know, which isn't to mean that we don't supervise it and watch it all the time. But my point here is that if you build the model and say, well, that's good enough for normal running, and when you know when the VAR explodes or the correlation explodes in the portfolio, I'll have to step in and make a discretionary call on down gearing or cutting out a a, sec, a position or, or a sector or something like that. So if, if you if somebody says to you, I'm 95% of the time systematic and I you know I've got a discretionary overlay. Mm-hmm. No, Niels, you are 100% sure. discretionary, sure. and you and you will be unable to get the confidence about. About the uh, you know the the integrity of, of the models that you developed and the and the the usefulness of any back tests that you do. So last point, I'm sorry, you, you, I keep banging on, no. but you know when I talk about that risk review process being both at a component level and then also aggregated across the um, uh, the whole release. That's really crucial because mm-hmm. what you're what we're doing in that exercise is basically going back through time and, and challenging ourselves to say, could we have run that program? Mm-hmm. Because if you if you you know you can have oh this is a brilliant fantastic <laughs> new model and I'll just bung them all together and if and if in um, you know if in if in ninety four or um, you know in two thousand and five or two thousand and nine it would have concentrated the um, the portfolio into a place where you just couldn't 
have hung on to that size position mm -hmm. and you would have you know you would have intervened as a manager or your client would have called you up and said what the heck are you doing mm -hmm. then then that then you can't you can't launch that program you've got to build in a, an appropriate constraint or you've got to modify the ad mixture so that it doesn't doesn't do that under those circumstances. Does sure. that make sense? It, so, it makes uh, it makes a lot of sense. And I think actually you said some very thing, something very early on in this answer that I think is 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 really really crucial because no doubt you know there are so many firms uh, that uh, aspires to be like an aspect or aspires to be like a Winton because we believe that this is what investors want us to be and therefore we should be like them. At the same time. Nobody's going to buy a firm that essentially are just trying to be a lookalike of something else because then they can just buy the real thing, so to speak. Yep. So yep. we also try to be different and differentiate ourselves. And I think what people sometimes forget, and that is that the only thing that really differentiates one manager to another, that's the manager themselves. So be true to yourself, I think, is such great advice because that's really what it comes down to. I would say so too. Yeah. What do I want to finish off with? Um, because we could go on for a long time and I really, <laughs> I'm really enjoying this. Um, is there any book that you would recommend people to read if they want to um, understand? Or something, a, a book maybe that has been, and, and maybe I'm not referring to your physics books back at Oxford, but maybe just something that has over, over your career made a big impact uh, in you and, and something you would recommend people? Mm. What do I think? Well, I, 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 you know, harp back to the days of um, Michael Adams' father, Cyril, handing us a book of technical trading mm -hmm. um, models. You know, that was very formative. Right. I have, I've always, I've always credited Jack Schwager sure. with it, but I'm not sure that it was Schwager's book. Sure. But, but you know, let, so I would, I would refer to that as a good um, primer. Sure. And and also more recently, I, I've had the the pleasure of meeting meeting Antti Ilmanen, and I think um, that he's just done a super job of sort of surveying the the, um, the space. So. You know, in the, in the spirit of learn everything you can, mm. and and then focus on on where your passion is. I, I'm I'm a big, so I, I sort of read. Um, you know, I like the you know, short history of, of of Britain, or or I think there's a one book called um, Brideshead uh, Abbreviated. So it's just sort of <laughs> precied versions of, sure. of the great novels because life is way too short, and there isn't time to to read everything that I'd love to read. So similarly with some of these, you know, like Auntie's book, um, it's it's a uh, you know an absolute classic to give you an overview of many of. Uh, quantitative uh, investing techniques sure if you marty could go back and meet your younger self is there anything you would tell yourself to do differently um based on all your experience that you have now um lots nails <laughs> <laughs> oh. um but you know no big thing because sure. it's it's it you know you 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 can't have that um, you can't have that wisdom until you've got the scars that that, that go with it. Sure. Um, I think probably you know recognizing the value of of uh, teamship, uh, mm -hmm. you know, co collegiate, um, you know, reliance on one another. Um, you know, if I could have done that a few years earlier, that probably would have been good. If I could have recognized recognize the importance of 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 chemistry and sure. and um you know how important it is that you just are comfortable with with the people that you, you were working with that would that would be another thing to learn um would i have done something completely different i i doubt it this, sure, is, this, sure. has, been, this has been a heck of a journey yeah absolutely final almost final question uh, marty is there a fun fact that you can share that about yourself that people who might even know you um, don't know about you? Oh, <laughs> uh, very, very little fun. Um. <laughs> it could be a talent, a hidden talent. It could be anything. I don't know. Um, I have heard many different uh, answers to this question. Uh, let me put it like that. And there is no wrong or right. 
No, the, you know, what my, my friends w w would all roll their eyebrows, and, <laughs> and particularly my kids, because um, so the, the, the little anecdote I'll, 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 I'll end on is sure. that I, I, I talked about, you know, my eager days as a skier and mountain climber. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, my, the romance with my wife began um, on a climbing expedition up uh, Mount Kenya. Mm -hmm. And um, so to celebrate that on our 10th wedding anniversary, I surprised the family and uh, took everyone. You know, so we had four little kids by sure. then and, and took them all down to Kenya for a surprise uh, vacation. Sure. And on the plane down there, um, so this is pre-9-11, uh, pre sure. a, a nutter got in the cockpit <laughs> and uh, took control of the jumbo jet and we basically went to free fall oh, fell shoot. out of, fell out of the sky and it was it was all quite dramatic yeah. and um and very traumatic um and and we landed and uh, and and got on with our lives but it was sort of a a, a singular uh, singular watershed so sure. you know my children always go oh don't don't yeah. tell the, don't, don't tell the airplane story dad <laughs> So I've been tried and tested by British Airways, and I understand that as part of the uh, as part of the training program now for cabin staff, the the film of of that uh, of wow. that flight is is part of their training. Wow, fantastic! Now I asked you earlier today about what investors are not asking you to you know about important questions. So I also need to be. Um, you know, testing my, my own efforts. So I want to ask you if there's anything you feel that I've missed something that you want to add um, to ensure that I've done justice to you, the AHL story, the aspect story, anything. And, and, and obviously at the same time, um, thanking you for helping democratize things by sharing all of this. Niels, I think you're doing a, a, a you know, I, I'm doing my part and you're doing yours through these through these podcasts. So so thank you. Um, I think that I, I mean, I've become convinced over the years that the role of systematic trading is, you know, is key, is core to a well-balanced portfolio. Mm. I don't actually think there's magic to it. So, you know, that I, I, this could just be shooting myself in the foot. But I think this is less about the genius of the trader mm. than about the uh, repeatability, robustness, thoroughness, and, and uh, extensibility of the approach. Mm. So I think that, that um, you know, whereas managed futures, like so many other hedge fund or alternative industries has grown out of the flamboyance and the uniqueness and the the flair of individuals i think that the future is you know it takes it, you've got to have those but it, it it does play more to a um you know to to a model portfolio view of the world that you you know that you need this and you need other strategies and whether you get them all from one shop that doesn't seem like a sustainable outlook does it sure. but you know whether you get all of the pieces of your portfolio from um, one shop or whether you get them from numerous different shops which I espouse because I think people should sure. uh, concentrate um, you know I think that's that's the, the way it's going mm. um, and and that's what I've tried to do and and that's where, where aspect has positioned itself um, so less about the the cult of personality mm. and more about the cult of of robustness and and reliability and evolutionary improvement definitely now before we finish uh, Marty where, where what's the best place for people to reach out to learn more about aspect capital um, we do have a, a very nice website, aspectcapital.com, mm -hmm. I think, or, or, or email uh, Aspect Capital uh, Client Services at Aspect Capital. Fantastic. Com. Yeah. And I'll make sure that, of course, all of these details are uh, also showing up in the show notes page on toptradersonplug.com so that people can definitely connect and learn a lot more. So all I have left to say, Marty, is... This has been a pleasure. This has been an immense privilege and honor to have you on. And I have enjoyed it uh, thoroughly. And I, uh, I look forward to uh, connecting again and, and uh, hearing about the great work that you do uh, at Aspect. 
Niels, it, it, it's been my pleasure. Um, and, and we can wake up that, that lady at the dinner table now that, <laughs> that, 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 that we're done. Um, and, and I look forward to, uh, to seeing you soon. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Marty. Take care. All the best. Cheers. Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.